Hello there. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Hello there. I want to talk to you uh, somewhat briefly today. <clears throat> I'm sorry. This came up in my throat right when I started talking. I'm going to talk to you about memory. The unit that we're looking at, obviously, now is, is about memory. Short-term, long-term, sensory, working, so on and so forth. So be sure and read the material read it thoroughly so that you understand it because a lot of people have a, these false conceptions about what memory is. Very basically, your memory is not the clear picture that you think it is. Not to say that you can't remember some things clearly, but that you're going to run into a problem with details because the memories just don't, they don't work that well in some cases. Um... If, a, if you had an experience when you were five years old and now you're 20, depending on the significance of the experience, uh, you may remember some details. And I underlined the word may. We tend to lose those uh, because everything that we deal with in memory is a concept. It's a construction of an event or an experience experiences and events are somewhat different there's more involvement on your part in an experience you're you're directly a part of the happening as opposed to an event that you may be told about or witness or whatever the case is but you don't have direct involvement and in, in memory <coughs> maybe you're getting a picture memory is a hard thing to get information into memory you have to work um or if it's a very significant event, you don't have to do as much work. But recalling all of that uh, information is going to be troublesome. And it's proven every day. But it doesn't matter how smart, quote, smart you are. Memory is a tricky little animal. <clears throat> so let's talk about this business, uh, about retrieving information from memory. And let's begin with what we call retrieval. Retrieval is done through uh, different aspects of the function of memory. <clears throat> the most common is, is a retrieval cue. A retrieval cue is a clue or a prompt that, that quote, jogs your memory. It's not really jogging. What's happening is chemical functions are taking place. Electrical stuff is happening. So retrieval cues, a clue or a prompt. And there are three types of these things. First is called recognition. Recognition cue is a specific cue. It's a cue that <clears throat> either you've developed or the way information went into the memory system, uh, in order for you to retrieve it, you have a specific cue something that's very specific to that particular memory as opposed to recall recall is a general cue it's not specific necessarily even to the event it's just something that could even be just similar it's one of those oh yeah i re that reminds me of this uh two disconnected occurrences and uh, your cue causes retrieval to happen. I hope that makes sense. General cues, which is recall, recognition, which is a specific cue. Oh, yeah. I remember, oh, I'm looking at that green plant and remembers reminds me that I have this really neat green T-shirt. Right? See how that works? Uh, or in general, plants. Oh, yeah, plants reminds me of Grandma's house and all the plants outside. There's a minute difference. And the third thing is priming. So retrieval cues or recognition, recall, and then finally priming. And this one's weird. Priming occurs whether you know it's happened or not. It's based on exposure. So I've been exposed at some point to something, and then... I develop a memory from that. It, this priming can enhance memory 
or it can inhibit memory. It can interfere with memory of anything. So the the bottom line is it's still a cue. So priming, prior exposure to something, and this may or may not be, you may may or not, you may or may not be aware of the exposure. Those are the three retrieval cues. <clears throat> you need to understand those because now we're going to talk about forgetting. When I forget something, what happens? Well, here you go. We don't know. <laughs> Somewhat we do. We do have theories. We also have these two brand new hypotheses. Um, <clears throat> they aren't proven into theory yet. They're being investigated. The first of these two hypotheses is called misplaced. It's just like you putting your keys down somewhere and you can't find them now. Misplaced information. It went through encoding, which is the information being put into the memory system. And uh, once it's in there now, I don't, my brain's going, where did I put that? It, it's it's not cap It's not able at some for some reason at the moment to find that that information. And the other brand new thing, the second hypothesis is called physical trace uh, disappearance. And it's exactly what it says. Your brain is chemical and electrical. So everything that's going on up there is based on chemicals and electricity. Physical trace disappearing means that whatever the, the highway was from the from the insertion of that memory into the system and then where it wound up, there's no the road is washed away. There's no more there's no tracing to get to that memory. So there's a failure somewhere in the in the system. Now, here's some more explanation as to problems with memory. And I'm going to name off some brain parts for you and that are involved, among other things. Prefrontal cortex inhibits activity of the hippocampus. You can look those things up. Prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus are involved in memory trace. So if if my if I'm exercising this memory, then that trace is going to remain rather strong. However, if the prefrontal cortex is inhibiting hippocampal activity, then if it's persistent and long term, it will weaken that memory trace. So the principle of use it or lose it applies here. If you have any questions about that, look up those two new hypotheses and see uh, see what you think of those. Uh, as I was saying this, I was remembering something else. I want to tell you a couple of things. There is neuronal involvement in the hippocampus, and they have it, those have to do with uh, memory function. There's a thing called pattern separation and pattern completion. And again, this occurs in the hippocampus. You, when those things get out of whack, memory becomes impaired because of things like forgetfulness or repeating yourself. How many, how many times have you been around old people and they tell you something five minutes later, they tell it to you again as though they've never told it to you. Uh, that's a pattern. That's a pattern uh, separation problem. That's a, that's a, a well-known problem. So um, we want to live in the realm of pattern completion. Pattern completion sorts out information. It makes sense of information, experiences, perceptions. And when that's working properly, you don't you don't really suffer from this pattern separation business so much. So completion and separation. Pattern separation is not good. Pattern completion is. So there's some neuroscience for you. All righty. Let's look quickly 
at the theories of forgetting. And then I'm going to leave you with a, a short discussion about amnesia. <clears throat> Five key theories of forgetting. Number one. Now, remember I told you that there are two brand new hypotheses. The, the trace loss and misplaced information. Those aren't theories. What we're talking about now are. Let's begin with the first one and probably the one that, that you've experienced, not personally, but among older people around you. It's called the decay theory. Your brain is a biological thing. Biology in human beings and everywhere else actually breaks down with time. So it's the same with your brain. The ability to have functioning memory declines over time. Here's a scary thought for you. How old do you think you are when your memory begins to decline? If you said 25 years old, you're right. At the young old age, a young, young age of 25, you begin the decay process. What a bummer. It's not rapid unless you have Alzheimer's or some other disease. I think the youngest diagnosed case of Alzheimer's was in fact in a 25-year-old, no, a 19-year-old uh, male. So this stuff can get you at any time, this Alzheimer's madness. The decay theory then, <clears throat> when you process, when you form a memory it's processed in a physical form <clears throat> it's biology physical stuff breaks down over time including your brain including the functions of your brain as well so this decay theory tells you that over time you're going to lose memory function period some more than others it's genetic some people are sharp uh, up until the day they die at 92, uh, others began to have difficulties in their 40s. As I said a while ago, 25 years of age, that's the break point. That's decay theory. Second theory is called interference theory. There are two types of interference theory, retroactive and proactive. <clears throat> retroactive. Retroactive interference theory. New information interferes with old information. So I'll use a phone number as an example. <clears throat> Let's say I've had this phone number for five years and I change carriers and for some reason I can't port in my, my old phone number. So I have to get a new phone number. Now I'm immediately able for some reason to remember my new phone number. And somebody asks me, what was your old phone number? And I go, hmm, I, I don't remember. That's retroactive interference theory. The new phone number is interfering with your ability to remember your old phone number. Pretty simple. And then the opposite is true. Proactive. Same situation. Change carriers. Same scenario. Get my new phone number. Trying to begin to memorize it, which is something we, if we had time, we'd talk about. Memorization <clears throat> is failing me because I keep remembering my old phone number. And I really apologize for this frog in my throat. Can't get it out. So retroactive, new, inter new information interferes with remembering old information, and then proactive, just the opposite. Pretty simple. All of these are very common, by the way. Number three is motivated forgetting. <clears throat> this can get a little bit involved. Motivated forgetting uh, in modern science is considered a conscious thing done by a thing called suppression. I suppress that information. It's troublesome. It's painful. It's upsetting. Whatever the case is, it's all negative, and I don't want to remember it, so I suppress that. I shove it way back in the dark corners of my mind, so to speak. If you want the older version, that's a Freudian thing, and it's called repression 
and it's an unconscious occurrence. There's a lot of debate about if there's really an unconscious. But nonetheless, Freudian explanations were in the realm of repression. Same function, only you don't know you're doing it. You're, you're repressing the information. Uh, modern, conscious effort, suppression. Old hat, old explanations, repression in the unconscious realm. <clears throat> Number four, encoding failure. <clears throat> if you've read the material, then you know that there are three models of memory. The first model is called information processing. In information processing, we have encoding, um, storage, and retrieval. So encoding is the first step. I do, my, my brain encodes information which is the act of putting the information into the system. It doesn't say successfully putting the information in the system. It says that encoding is putting information in the system, meaning that it may or may not get there. And that's why encoding failure is troublesome because what that means is information you were exposed to didn't get into your memory system because encoding didn't work for whatever reasons there were. Could have been distraction. Could have been you had a bad day. I didn't sleep well last night. I'm ill. It could be a lot of things that can cause encoding failure. Now the bottom line is you may as well not have been exposed to whatever the information is because it never made it into your memory anyway. <clears throat> so it's not usable because you don't even know about it. It's not in here. <clears throat> can it be fixed? The only way you can do that is to be re-exposed to the same information and hopefully this thing will work. It's not that bad, but it occurs. And then the last one, the last of the five theories is called retrieval failure. And it means exactly what it says. Your cues didn't work. You're trying to remember the answer on an exam to this question, and you just can't do it. The cues aren't working. I know that, but I can't think of it. <clears throat> Very sorry. So I finished the exam, put it down, turn it in, walk down the hall in the classroom building, and the answer comes to me. We've all had it happen. And the most aggravating retrieval failure is called tip of the tongue failure. And I don't know about you, but that one drives me uh, gaga. That's when you, it's almost literally like it's on the tip of your tongue. What it is, is it's right there uh, at the retrieval, in the retrieval process, but you're just not able to come uh, to make the completion. Remember that uh, completion business? When I said that you, um, that's what you want to occur you want this completion thing to happen, pattern completion. Well, in retrieval, tip of the tongue failure, you're almost there, but you can't quite do it. That's those deals where you walk around going, uh, Bob, Jim, uh, Larry, I know this guy's name, Peter. Uh, and you name off or you go A, B, C, D. You do all these crazy things, and, and most of the time that doesn't work. You're having a, you're having a chemical failure. So those are the five key theories. And the last thing I want to talk to you about, um, amnesia. And I'll do this quickly because we've been, we're approaching 20 minutes here. Retrograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is the kind of amnesia you're familiar with. It's where you get thumped in the head and you can't remember anything. Can't remember my name. Can't remember what day it is. Don't know where I'm at. That's retrograde amnesia. Concussions are notorious for causing that. They ask a football player if it gets hit in the head, or in my case, a rugby player, do you know where you are? That's the head injury uh, protocol they go through. Retrograde, That again, that's the amnesia you're familiar with. Head injury, boom, now my memory's gone. That's recoverable in some cases. depends on the damage. The damage isn't too great. Through some therapy and some medications, we can 
they can the medical side can bring those memories back maybe takes a lot of therapy the other kind is called a uh, anterograde anterograde amnesia is just the opposite from retrograde again bam i get hit in the head i can remember all the past but i cannot form new memories now let me tell you a little uh, bugaboo here it can come from bam getting hit in the head but it can also come from alcoholism and, and drug addiction uh, in any time you abuse any chemical like that you suffer the potential for developing anterograde amnesia and guess what you can't fix it the destruction is there and it won't go away so uh, it's a nasty little thing don't want to get too too much on the soapbox about it all righty there are a couple other things we could do Eyewitness, eyewitness testimony, I said I'd end with amnesia, but let me brush this by you real quick. Eyewitness testimony is horrible. The court system loves it. Uh, psycho psychologists and psychiatrists don't love it because it uh, is a false creation in some cases. People are very susceptible to being led. Uh, you can Many experiments have been done with eyewitness testimony. And it's proven time and time again in the scientific community to be very fallible. It's not very good at all. Three people see something happen, all three have different stories, but yet the court system said, Oh, we got an eyewitness. Well, good for you. It, it's, you know, whatever. And then we can also, uh, and we also have to deal with false creations, things that we think happened, and they we think so hard about it, and so for so long about it, we think it really did happen. So there you go. That's a little bit of stuff about false memory, eyewitness testimony, blah, blah, blah. Be sure and read this section thoroughly. It's a good section. It's going to clear, clear up a lot of your misconceptions about your memory. See you around.